good afternoon or morning, year 10, depending on when you're watching this. Um, so this week we are back to literature. Woohoo! I'm sure you were thrilled with the structure question last week. So you'll be very excited to get back to some of that. Now, I'm pretty sure all of you covered Act 1 very thoroughly last year um, because a lot of people spent a lot of time on Act 1. And it was the later acts that um, some groups ran out of time for. So I haven't revised Act 1 in too much depth. Um, we did some work in the first week back after Easter on GCSE pod. But now I want us to move on to Act 2, Scene 2. For a couple of reasons. This is when we've really got the plot starting to move. Okay, uh, Duncan is being killed off stage at this point. So this is that pivotal turning point. Uh, there is essentially no going back from this moment for Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. Um, and it's really interesting, this scene, how they react, how they react together, how they react differently, uh, what we learn about their characters and some of the techniques and language that Shakespeare uses in this scene. So that's why I want us to look at and focus on this. So today's date is Thursday the 7th of March, of May, sorry, not March. We're not going back in time, guys. Uh, can you write that down in your class workbooks, please? Remember, if you've only got a few lines left, new page. If you've got a good chunk of the page you've uh, finished working on, then please don't waste it. Let's save the trees. So we've got Macbeth, Act 2, Scene 2, Thursday the 7th of May, and our subheading is going to be The Aftermath. Now, that's not what this act is called. That's just what I'm calling it, OK? Because the main aspects of this scene are, in essence, the aftermath, the reaction, the ramifications of their actions, both Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. So get that noted down. I'm going to move on to the next slide. So if you need a little bit longer to write it down, please just press forward. And do not forget, underline all of those with a ruler. Now, lesson objective. You're writing this down, OK? The black writing at the top that isn't in a yellowish box is the lesson objective. So to identify and analyse inconsistencies. Remember, inconsistency is when something isn't consistent. So when we start to see change, when we start to see contrast, when we see contradictions in Lady Macbeth's character, and to investigate the use of rhythm and language to expose characters' emotions. So I want you to write that down. I know it's a long sentence, but I've got faith in you guys. Get that underlined with a ruler as well. Uh, and then below, I want you to write the subheading, pop quiz mini review. Um, I'm just going to read these questions very quickly to you. I'm not going to go through it because this is just a little starter, a recap of what you should already know about Act 1 and some key things to, for me to test to make sure you've looked at them again, you've reminded yourself again. So you're going to need to look at Act 1 because I'm assuming you haven't learned these quotes off by heart and you're going to need to find the quotes to answer these questions. So. How is Macbeth described before we meet him in Act 1? So remember, you're going to be looking very early in that act, OK? It's before we meet Macbeth, before he first is on stage, someone describes him in a certain way. How is he described? Give me at least one quote that describes Macbeth before we meet him. Then, what are the two quotes that suggest a connection between Macbeth and the witches before they meet. Most of you might need a clue for this, but I'm going to give a little clue just in case anyone's struggling. The two quotes are from different people. So if we're looking at connections between Macbeth and the witches, what two people might we be looking for those quotes to be from? Him, him. Uh, next one. Who first thinks about or considers Duncan's murder? between Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. So which one of them do we see thinking about this or discussing it or planning it first? Okay, I want you to go back through and I want you to think about who do you think it contemplates that idea first? And give me the quote that makes you think, one, it's that person, and B, tell me what it is in that quote that makes you believe they're contemplating Macbeth's uh, sorry, not Macbeth, Duncan's murder or um, just death. Okay. And then Act 
one scene seven is a really, really key scene. Okay, we've got the big argument between Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. Are they going to go through with it? Is Macbeth going to back out of it? Macbeth, um, Lady Macbeth, sorry, is a little brilliant manipulator in this scene, okay? So I want you to find three of the persuasive techniques that she uses. So I want you to think about different techniques, different ways we can manipulate and persuade people. I want you to note three different techniques that you could use down. And then I want you to give me the quote that shows Lady Macbeth using that technique. You don't have to analyse it or zoom in on it. I just want what is the technique and what is the quote that shows that. Okay, a nice, easy review, revision start. Uh, feel free to pause this here uh, because obviously that will take you some time. You're going to have to keep going back to Act 1, uh, but I'm going to move on to the next part of this lesson. Now, Act 2, Scene 2, Lady Macbeth. So, read Act 2, Scene 2 before you work through any of these questions and tasks. So you've been going back through little sections of Act 1 uh, because you needed to find quotes. Now I want us, don't worry about reading Act 2, Scene 1 at the moment. Um, read Act 2, Scene 2, okay? Give it a quick read. It doesn't matter if you don't understand everything that's happening, okay? Some of the key things you will be able to pick up because actually what's ha a lot of what is said and what's happening in this scene isn't very complicated to, to grasp. It gets more complicated once we start analysing it in detail, but to just get the gist of what's happening isn't too difficult in this scene. But don't panic about the bits you don't understand. That won't be a problem at the moment. But what I want us to look at is, uh, look at Lady Macbeth's first two lines. What do they suggest about her? So she says, That which hath made them drunk hath made me bold. What hath quenched them hath given me fire. So the, the thing that she's talking about, okay, is um, alcohol to a degree. Okay, she's been filling up or having her maids fill up their glasses. We know uh, later on that she does, in fact, drug their posse. Um, as in, she slipped sleeping drugs into their drinks. So she's saying that would have made them drunk. So the men have been sat there drinking, drink after drink after drink. They've got drunk when we're drunk. We're weaker, you know, we can't walk properly, we don't follow things properly, we don't, we slur, we don't speak properly. So they've lost their senses to a degree, they're weakened, okay, they're more frail, they're more incapable of reasoning, understanding what's happening around them. But she's saying, it hath made me bold. So is the drink having the same effect on her as it is to them? If not, why? What do we see Lady Macbeth trying to imply about herself? Is she trying to suggest that she's just the same as everybody else? Or is she implying here that somehow she's different? And that difference, let's look at the tone of that, have made me bold. Bold is something we um, connect to bravery and daring. So she's not just saying she's reacted differently to this. She's saying that she's actually reacted in a superb way to them, contrasting it. They're drunk, they're weak, they're unable. She's become bold, she's become braver. Now that's interesting on two levels. Uh, one, that again is showing Lady Macbeth exerting her self-belief of authority. She's comparing herself to men, but comparing herself as better than. The same as we've seen when. When did Lady Macbeth appear to suggest that she might be stronger or smarter or more logical than a man? Where have we seen that before? When you're thinking about this and listening to me rambling on, I want you to be adding these ideas and these answers to your annotations. So if you've got your own book, brilliant, annotate around these quotes. If you don't, copy these quotes down into your craftswork book and annotate around them. Okay, and then she said, what hath quenched them hath given me fire. Okay, so that again links that boldness, doesn't it? Fire. Fire is uh, powerful, it's deadly, it's dangerous, but it's also a necessity to survive. 
You know, we need fire to cook meat to be able to eat it safely. We need fire to ward off predators. We need fire to keep ourselves warm and not freeze. So again, that fire has that connotation of passion, that boldness, that fierceness. She's now hungry for it. Now, is she hungry physically for the death of Duncan? She's bloodthirsty. Or is she hungry for that elevation in rank and position? Or is she, or is Shakespeare really implying, actually, she's dangerous at the moment. She's on fire. She is something that can be destructive. And could we look at that as an overall representation of the Lady Macbeth, looking at not just this line in and of itself, but within the whole play? Could we say that Lady Macbeth is someone who's destructive? Has she and Macbeth got a destructive relationship? Could we blame her? Could we put the destruction of Macbeth on her shoulders? Uh, fire burns, doesn't it? You think at the beginning, he was, you know, revered. He was given a promotion. And then look at how it ends. They literally, uh, sorry, they figuratively burnt their lives down. They destroyed everything they had, everything they, that was good about them, everything that people thought of them. So I think that's quite a nice um, kind of ideas to look at. And then we've got, if you've got the same text as me, the one from Oxford School of Shakespeare, you'll see it says an owl shrieks. Not every production will have that in it. Um, and that's also the same on stage. Some stage performances will have a little bit kind of react to a noise, but we won't hear it. Start, some performances will have the noise playing in the background, so we hear it and then see her reaction. This particular version right and our shriek so that we're aware uh, as readers what this next line is um, referencing so remember initially she said she's bold she's got fire and then an owl shriek hot peace it was the owl that shrieked the fatal bellman which gives the sternest good night he is about it the doors are open and the surfeited grooms do mock their charge with snores i've dropped their pockets that death and nature do contend about them, whether they live or die. Now, the reason we've got an owl is what we've been told she hears shrieking, but she also references an owl uh, in the next line. It was the owl that shrieked. Now, the owl was uh, like a raven. It was thought to be a bird of ill omen and is now compared to the night watchman who rings the bell outside the cells of the prisoners condemned to death. So what she's saying is that how she's heard is the, is the ill omen for Duncan because she knows that at this moment in time, Macbeth should be either on his way to murder Duncan or in the room murdering him. So she's implying that that owl was the omen representing um, Duncan's downfall, well, his death. But we've got huh, Okay, now, if you're bold, if you're brave, if you're brazen, if you're fired and you're ready to fight and attack and do this, and you hear an owl shriek, would you expect that response? Hark, oh, it's like that there's like a shock there, peace, like, oh, quiet, you know? And is the peace she's asking for peace from the owl, the noise, the shriek, or is it peace within herself because the noise has kind of riled her up and made her nervous? So have a think about that. What's interesting about that contrast? Where and um, keep that in your mind as we carry on reading, because where else do we see Lady Macbeth presenting contrast about herself? Um, and then, uh, I've said, why has Shakespeare introduced the sound of the owl here? Now I've told you what the owl represented, what its kind of symbolism was. Um, so why do you think he's brought that in? We know, we already know as an audience, that Macbeth is there killing Duncan because th the last scene we saw was him with the dagger in his hand walking towards Duncan's chamber ready after he's um, had that hallucination of the dagger floating. So we don't need an omen. Therefore, and obviously Lady Macbeth doesn't need an omen, she knows what Macbeth's doing. So therefore, why bring it in? Now, that connects to that chain of being. 
Okay, if you remember from last year, the great chain of being, that idea that the king is anointed and chosen by God. Only God can choose to take out a king. Okay, only God decides when a king dies. God is the one that chooses who should be king. And if you cross that, if you go against that, you break that chain of being. You break, A, your connection with God, but you also create chaos in the land because that land is now not anointed by God. God is not connected to the ruler anymore. Therefore, chaos ensues. And chaos isn't just in the people. Chaos is in everything because God creates everything. He's part of all nature. He creates all nature. So having the owl shriek is that reference, isn't it, to nature being aware, to the idea that something dark is happening and that it isn't just Macbeth and Lady Macbeth that's potentially going to be affected by this. And we see under Macbeth's rule that everybody's affected by it. Okay, He does not lead Scotland to a happy and safe place. Um, under his rule, Scotland is is full of murder and fear and anxiety. Um, and now, let's have a look at Lady Macbeth. She says, uh, where am I looking to? Enter Macbeth with two bloody daggers, Macbeth. Who's there? What told? Lady Macbeth, alack, I'm afraid they have awakened. It is not done. The attempt and not the deed confounds us. Hark! I laid their daggers ready. He could not miss them. Had he not resembled my father as he slept, I'd have done it. Now, why is that phrase so interesting? Okay. So, she tells us a few things here. Okay. She tells us, I laid their daggers ready. Okay. So, that means she must have been where? What, where would these daggers be? She's talking about the daggers of the guards. So that means that after the guards got knocked out with the um, drug that she put in their drinks, she went in, she took their knives out of their um, kind of sheaths, out of where they would hold them, uh, their daggers, sorry, and she laid them accessible, obvious, in plain sight for Macbeth to use. Because obviously they're planning on um, setting the guards up or make it look as though the guards are the ones that have killed Duncan. So she's been very active in this. I mean, she knows for well that Macbeth would know where these men keep their daggers. He's a soldier, so he would be very well aware. So it's interesting that she goes to lay them out. Again, it reiterates her lack of faith in him. But how does that contrast with that opening report from the captain? We're told that he's steel um, burned uh, was brandished with blood and it was almost on, it looked as though it was almost on fire we're told that he um, tore a man from nave to chaps he stuck his sword in him and he ripped him down the middle these are not the actions of a cowardly man of a insecure man of a man that doesn't understand death murder warfare who's adverse to blood. This doesn't strike me as a man that would need the weapon that he's going to use laid out very clearly and obviously. Yet she's done that. So what does that show about that dynamic between them? What does that tell us about her belief of her superiority over Macbeth? What does that show about how little she understands who he is when he's away from her? Would she recognise the way the captain spoke about her husband? Because she appears to have a very different view of him. Don't forget, feel free to keep pausing this as I speak so that you can make these annotations. But on another level, we're told she was in that room. She was in the room. The guards were asleep. Duncan was obviously asleep. Otherwise, she couldn't have got away with laying the daggers ready for him. And she even says... Had he not resembled my father as he slept? So the he is Duncan. She saw him sleeping, unprotected. She had daggers in her hand. She was perfectly able to kill him. She had everything she needed. She was in the room. 
Duncan was asleep, the guards were drugged, and she even acknowledges that she had the opportunity, because she says, again, had he not resembled my father as he slept, I'd have done it. So, she had the opportunity, we know she's got the desire and the motive, but she didn't do it. What does that suggest about her? How does that fit in to those expectations of an Elizabethan and Jacobean woman? Should a Jacobean woman be able to kill somebody? No. They should hate violence. They should abhor violence and blood. They shouldn't be able to even think about it, never mind carry it out. They are meant to be protectors and nurturers. Duncan is a reasonably old man, vulnerable because he's asleep, vulnerable because his guards aren't able to protect him. That's somebody she should protect, not somebody she should kill. And she doesn't kill him. She can't do it. Yet, in Act 1, Scene 7, she, when she's trying to manipulate Macbeth and, you know, argue the point with him, she specifically says that had she promised to do this, this murder, the same as Macbeth had promised her after she'd presented him with her plans, that... No matter how bad it was, if she promised to do something to Macbeth, she'd do it. She says that if she promised to, she would have taken her baby from her breast while it was feeding and bashed its brains in. Now, you can't get more brutal, more violent, more savage, more dark than that. She's saying her own child that she born that she was in the middle of feeding, that is at its most vulnerable, that has complete trust and faith in you as a mother, that you're supposed to love beyond anything else. She's saying if she'd made a promise to Macbeth, she would have killed that child. Yet here, she says, whoa, yeah, if Duncan had a look like my dad, I'd have killed him. But, yeah, he did. So, do we actually believe that Lady Macbeth is as bold, is as full of fire, and is as able to be violent and dangerous as she pretends. Because she's claiming that she could do all of this. She's claiming she would do it. Yet, this is, seems like quite a weak excuse. Okay, you look like your father. Yes, you're supposed to honour your father. You're supposed to love your father. Yet you claimed you'd be able to not just kill, but really violently kill your own baby. So there's a real contrast there. We're getting this sense that Lady Macbeth maybe isn't the person she pretends to be, and that actually maybe more of Lady Macbeth does link to those expectations of a Jacobean woman. She doesn't want to, and we know that because she says, unsex me here. She wanted that femininity taken away. And maybe here, she felt that feminine, that inability to do it, and she didn't like it, so she's trying to make an excuse. But it creates a, an interesting contrast with how frustrated and angry and aggressive and critical she is in Macbeth whenever he can't do something. And yet, look at her here, openly admitting she could have killed, she could have killed him, but he looked like her father, so she couldn't go through with it. And she says, um, he's about it. I'm not going to talk through that too much. I think I don't think you need me to explain that a lot. What um, could be of note of interest here? Okay, what does it mean, he's about it? Why it? Why is that interesting? Think about what the it means. Think about what using the term it suggests rather than what are the other words that could be there. Think about what we were just talking about, about Lady Macbeth potentially not being quite as bold, not being quite as okay with violence as she tries to um, present herself to be. And think about how that could relate to that word choice of it. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next um, slide. So if you need to pause this um, to rewind and carry on making those annotations, please do so. So, new subheading, rhythm and language. Iambic pentameter is used a lot throughout Macbeth. It's used a lot throughout a lot of Shakespeare's plays. But um, Macbeth, we have high um, volume of iambic pentameter. So, 
Uh, I want you to copy down what is in this yellow box, okay, minus the uh, bottom bullet point, so the first two bullet points in this yellowish box. So, iambic pentameter is a line made up of ten syllables. These are broken down into five unstressed syllables and five stressed syllables. In iambic pentameter, the rhythm is unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, and so on for uh, 10 syllables, okay, so uh, a beat of five. When we speak, our syllables are either stronger emphasis, stressed, which is a stronger emphasis, or unstressed, a weaker emphasis. We do this without even registering it as native speakers, okay, it becomes uh, just natural because we mimic, we mimic uh, the rhythm and the patterns of speech and um, pronunciation uh, that we hear around us and that we're taught. So, for example, the word remark consists of two syllables. Re is the unstressed syllable. That means it has the weaker emphasis. So when we say remark, we don't put the um in our voice on the re section. Okay. While mark is stressed. So that has that stronger emphasis, the m, the mark, is where we kind of put more of a tonal stress. Um, so what I want you to do is I want you to look at the line below, okay? That's taken from Macbeth, not from this scene, but it's taken from Macbeth. Um, and that shows you an example of the iambic pentameter in use. Um, I want you to go through this scene. I'm not going to do it with you, okay? And I want you to kind of beat out the de-dum, 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 de-dum as you read it, okay? And see what lines, where can you find that iambic pentameter, okay? We're going to look at this uh, more in the next slide uh, as well. But I want you to pause here and I just want you to read it through and you can uh, tap the de-dum. Uh, you can say de-dum, de-dum de-dum out loud as you read the line or you can read the line and do the de-dum on your chest or you can count it out on your fingers whichever's easiest for you okay so shakespeare's language and iambic pentameter so can you spot the shared lines in this dialogue so we have quite a few of them in this scene which is interesting uh, I'm not going to read the information about half and shared lines to you because it's all written there. So you, you can all read. It's pointless me reading that out loud to you. But I want you to read through that and I want you to copy those, uh, those two little paragraphs down in your notes. Okay. Uh, here is some example uh, taken from the an, an extract in this scene of those shared iambic pentameter lines. And now what's probably going to make this a lot easier to understand and get your head around is this YouTube clip link down the bottom, okay? Um, so I don't know if you're going to be, I don't think you'll be able to click on it and be taken to it. So you might need to take a photo of it on your phone and then key it in uh, to YouTube. Or you might be able to pause the video and do a copy and paste with the link. You guys are more techno savvy than me, so I'll leave that up to you to figure out. Um, but this link is, uh, it's, um, BBC put it up online, and what it is, is it's looking at a director and two actors prepping, rehearsing this scene before um, they're going to stage it. Um, and they talk about iambic pentameter, give examples of it, we see them counting it out, and then they look at and work out where the shared lines are and talk about the implication of those shared lines why Shakespeare does it, what it could imply and suggest about our, our characters in these moments. So I would really, really suggest you watch that YouTube clip, go through it, maybe make some notes if you want uh, while you're watching it, uh, because it's really going to help you with the next tasks. I'm going to move the uh, slide on now. So, shared lines. Let's look at these shared lines. Why is it interesting that Shakespeare has chosen these lines? What do they suggest about the characters and their thoughts, reactions, emotions in this scene? And what is interesting about the dialogue when they stop sharing lines? What might this represent or try to highlight? 
So we've got Lady Rebecca after I just read the the how do you not resemble my father? I'd have done it. She says my husband with a question mark. A question mark suggests she doesn't know. It's a lack of certainty. Okay. Now before she started speaking, we had Macbeth say, Who's there? What hole? So she's heard him speak. Then she's had that little kind of internal speech. And then she says, my husband, she's wondering, was that her husband's voice? So the fact that she doesn't recognise it is interesting. What does that suggest? Could that be suggesting a break in their connection? Could it be showing that actually she doesn't trust anything? She's unsure. And that gives away a sense that she's actually quite anxious and nervous unlike her claim at the beginning about being bold and then he says i have done the deed didst thou not hear a noise i heard the owl scream and the crickets cry did not you speak when now as i descend i hark who lies in the second chamber donald Bain. this is a sorry sight a foolish thought to say a sorry sight now it's not a huge section but we've got lots of playing, lots of sharing of those lines there. And think about it. What's happening? We're getting a series of different questions, aren't we? We're getting very short, very succinct, very abrupt answers. And they're followed by another question. Now, whenever we've got a series of questions, does that mean we're very confident about what's happening and about what's going on and about our environment? Or does it show we're not confident? Okay. We're doing question after question. It means there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a, our anxieties higher. So who's asking the questions? Well, have a look. Okay. What does that suggest? That person's feeling very anxious and unsure. The answers. Okay. What's interesting about the fact that they're very short? Now, could that mean they're not valuing the question could it mean that they're not that confident in their answers they're not elaborating or could it mean they're scared of their answers you know these are all the things we need to think about we need to explore those kind of multiple different things think about it reread it through what do you think what do you think those characters are feeling what does that shared line suggest to you and carry through to you is it a sense that the answers are very short because they're trying to get through this conversation, it's all very panicked, they're anxious, they want this conversation over. And then if we start to look as we go on, so she said, uh, Macbeth says, this is a sorry sight. What sorry sight is he referring to? What's happened there? What was sorry? The sight that he saw was Duncan's murdered body. That's the sorry side. Then you have a foolish thought to say a sorry side. So he says this is a sorry side. That shows what? Does he think what does he think what they did is perfectly fine? Does he think it's wrong? Does he seem to regret it? Is he showing a sense of remorse? Is he showing a sense of guilt? And if he is, she says a foolish thought to say a sorry side. Is she showing the same emotions? Is she acknowledging that what they've done is wrong? Is she showing any signs of regret or repentance? Then he says, there's one did laugh in sleep and one cried murder, that they did wake each other, I stood and heard them. But they did say their prayers and address them again to sleep. They were two lodged together. One cried, God bless us and our men. The other, as they had seen me with these hangman's hands, these hangman's hands, his hands are covered in blood. He stabbed Duncan multiple times. His hands show the sign of that murder. Listening their fear, I could not say amen. When they did say, God bless us, consider it not so deeply. Now, we've got a couple of questions here. He's saying that after he killed Duncan, okay, he heard someone uh, laugh in their sleep. And another person cry out the word murder. Okay, they woke each other up. Okay, and then they said their prayers because obviously it was a very religious time, and they went back to sleep. He's claiming that when they said "God bless us," what comes after that is "Amen." He couldn't say it. Now, did he really hear this? 
Have we got any examples where we know that Macbeth has imagined or hallucinated things before? Therefore, if we do, does it suggest that this definitely happened? If it didn't happen, what is it a sign of? If he's here, he heard, he, sorry, he saw the dagger before, okay? That could be showing his guilt. It could be showing his fear. It could be showing the fact that he's almost kind of backing out or doing it, but his subconscious wants him to murder Duncan because his subconscious wants to become king. Or it could be that he's seeing it because his subconscious is telling him not to do it. His subconscious knows that it's wrong. He's afraid. He's riddled with guilt. So the fact that he hears all of this, if it's a hallucination, well, what does that suggest? He's hearing one crime murder. Okay. Therefore, that is telling us that that's what he knows he is. Now, this is not, we know, the first time Macbeth has killed anybody. But it's the first time he's murdered them. He's killed in battle. That's fair game. You're a soldier. You're fighting other soldiers. You're not fighting somebody asleep, somebody old, somebody defenceless. That's murder. That's different. So he knows he's now changed. He's crossed a line. So is that his fear that's making him hear this? Is it his imagination? Um, that he's just so panicked that he's going to get caught. So therefore, it's actually not a moral issue at all. It's just panic about anyone finding out. Um, or is it a sign that he knows deep down now that he is not the person he was? He is a sinner. And that links to that fact that he's saying he couldn't say amen. Now, what's he done? He's killed the king. What's that broken? By breaking that, what does that break his connection to? He broke the chain of being, didn't he? Because he killed the king. Therefore, he broke his connection to God. When you say amen and you pray, who are you talking to? You're talking to God. If you've broken your connection with God, can you talk to him? No. So that's showing us that he's, he realises, you know, even subconsciously, because he's questioning, he's saying, you know, he says, but wherefore could I not pronounce Amen? Like, why couldn't I say it? So maybe he's not acknowledging it with his conscious mind, but his subconscious mind certainly seems to be aware that that connection's gone. Or could Shakespeare be trying to actually just say to the audience, if you go against God, if you were to break the chain of being, if you try and harm the king, you will cut yourself off from God. So it could be a reference to Macbeth's subconscious, his psychology, his guilt, his realisation and how he's become morally corrupt. Or, don't forget, who was this written for? It was written for King James I. What had happened about a year before this play was first uh, written and performed? The gunpowder got. The gunpowder got had aimed to kill James I. This is not a king that is liked by everybody. This is a king that has a lot of issues in his kingdom. There's a lot of people that don't like him. There's a lot of people unhappy with him. There's riots in the streets. This is a king that is paranoid about tons of things. This is a king that has quite a high um, reputation for putting you in the tower, for having people beheaded. So could Shakespeare be very clearly trying to... In and let the audience know and have James the first see that he's sending this message if you try and come against the king you will cut off your connection to God you'll be left you'll be abandoned and don't forget that was a genuine fear for them in Jacobin England they were incredibly religious it was a genuine they did not believe in another option it was God and you either went to hell or you went to heaven and if you cut off your connection with God, you're not going to heaven. But she says, consider it not so deeply. So both times he's expressed a sense of distress, a sense of guilt, a sense of fear. Has she tried to sympathise? Has she felt the same? Has she shared a vulnerability? Or has she just brushed it off? Is she very respectful in the way she responds or is she quite dismissive? Okay. 
Do they appear to be sharing lines at the moment? And if so, why? If not, why not? Are they now still in the same emotional state? Earlier on, they were both unsure. They were both anxious. They were both jumping at stuff. They both didn't know what was happening. Now, he's showing potentially some remorse. He's showing fear. Is she still showing the same? Are they still in line? Is that why they are sharing dialogue? Or is that what, uh, sharing lines, sorry? Or is that why they're no longer sharing lines? But wherefore could I not pronounce amen? I have most need of blessing and amen stuck in my throat. The deeds must not be thought after these ways. So it will make us mad. Now, if you've got your own text and you weren't with me last year, because I know anybody that was with me last year would have already done this, I would just highlight that line so you know your best. These deeds must not be thought after these ways. So it will make us mad. That is a masculine quote. Clearly foreshadowing here. One, what do we know happens to Lady Macbeth at the end of the play? She has gone mad. You know, she's sleepwalking. She's frantically re-washing her hands again and again. She's reliving the night, isn't she? She's saying lines almost from this scene. So the fact that she says, you, we can't talk about this. We, we can't think about this. If we think about this anymore, we keep thinking about it, it's going to send us insane. There's an irony to that, okay? She acknowledges what keep thinking about this will do, and then we see that that is actually her end. Beautiful example of foreshadowing from Shakespeare. Uh, and, and that continues as well, really, because me, me thought I heard a voice cry, sleep no more, Macbeth doth murder sleep, the innocent sleep, sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care, the death of each day's life, Saw labour's bar. How is that accurate? What is it that Lady Macbeth can't do? She can't properly sleep. She's sleepwalking. When she's asleep, she's unable to rest. She's unable to stop thinking about this. She's unable to stop reliving it. It's even how she kind of gives the game away because her, her nurse, her, um, her waiting woman, hears what she's saying and like, realises, you know, the thing she says makes it all very clear. So, uh, as I've said before, you need to be annotating those quotes and uh, phrases and different lines in your own copies if you've got them. If you don't, okay, then um, do it like um, some of those key ones that we've gone through. Do it like we do when we explode a quote. Okay, so write the quote. Uh, that can be a single line or a shared line. Okay, in the roughly in the middle of your page. Obviously, you don't take up a whole page. It would be within the middle of half a page because one quote shouldn't use the whole page. And then have different comments coming up around it. Think about connotations. Think about symbolism. Think about the rhythm. Think about the language. Think about the fact that somebody's asking a question, somebody's answering it. Think about the pace. Think about uh, the simplicity of the questions and the answers. What do they suggest? What's interesting? Where do we see that shift? Why do we see that shift? Uh, you can pause here, or I'm going to move on to the next slide. So, tension. Okay. This scene is one of the most tense in the whole play. We've had elements of tension coming in when the witches were there, when they were discussing King and the King. When Macbeth says, oh, nope, we're not going to do that anymore. We'll proceed no further with in this business. And then Lady Macbeth bullies him into it. We've had the tension when, you know, is this a dagger? He's not sure what he's seeing. We, we know when he's walking and going. But this is where the real tension comes. We don't have both of them on stage at the beginning. Lady Macbeth is claiming she's very confident. She's bold. But at the same time, she's jittery. She's reacting to noises. She doesn't recognise her husband's voice. Um, she's giving short, simple answers. You know, none of them are, um, there's a little section where they're not extending any real thought. It's all very quick and, and fast paced. Uh, implying fear, implying confusion. Uh, we've got the tension, is somebody else going to come into this scene? Has he managed to get it done? Um, I haven't, we haven't read through all of the scene. I'm going to look at more of it next week. 
Uh, and I want you, you can still use uh, lines for this that we haven't read through. Um, don't forget the little uh, kind of explanation aspects of key things that might confuse you on the left hand side of your page. Um, so use that to help you with any of the stuff that we haven't discussed already if you're struggling. But I want you to choose at least three quotes in this thing. You could easily get three quotes from just what we looked at. But if you want to move on to uh, other lines within the scene, that's fine. Uh, you're going to explode each of these quotes. So just as I've said already, half a page, roughly, per quote. Uh, and remember, at least one of those quotes needs to be a shared line. OK, and you're going to zoom in. I want you to zoom in and explode as many different aspects as you can. OK, explore word cards, punctuation, tone. I forgot a comma after tone, I do apologise. Position within the scene, symbolism and connotations of keywords. Does it connect or contrast to anything we've seen from that character or character's relationship together? Earlier on in the play, all seen. Okay. Always think about where Shakespeare is mirroring or contrasting. He uses both of those techniques often. Okay, and they're really they're really nice, good um, elements to pull out. They're easy to identify and recognise, and to pull out and analyse and explore. In your explosions, you must link to the effect on the audience. Link this to tone and connotations. So we're looking at tension. What is it about these quotes, about this dynamic, about this shared line that creates tension, that suggests tension? Okay. How does it develop your understanding of the characters, but also how do these quotes create tension? Now, tension can be created uh, as we, the audience, are left unsure. When we don't know what's happening, when we don't know what's going to happen or how something's going to work out, we can have, feel tense. Or with a sense of something bad working. It could be created as the character themselves is tense, or it could be through foreshadowing future problems or disasters for characters. So I want you to pause this here so you've got these kind of like pointers on the screen in front of you while you do this. Three quotes, okay? Probably easiest to pick three things from what we've looked at. But you don't have to, as long as it's in Act 2, Scene 2, any three quotes. One of them has to be a shared line. Explode as many different things as you can in it. Go back, look at your old quote explosions. Use that to prompt you, to remind you how we do this. Okay? Pause this, keep this on the screen the whole time you do it. It should take you, if you're doing these explosions well, this should take you at least 20 minutes to do three. At least. OK, don't rush it. Do it properly. You need these done well and detailed for your next task. OK, I'm going to move this slide on now. Uh, here is a little kind of layout of prompter. So you could flip between this and the other um, to help you. Or you could take a picture of the line. You could rewind it back and take a picture of the prompts on the old slide and then keep pause it here and keep this in front of you. Um, just different prompters and reminders of how we do it, okay? The keyword, whatever it is, suggests because, what is the language feature, where do we get links to a theme, where do we get links to context, is there a structural feature, one of the structural features we can point out is shared lines, okay? And a little tick point of all the different things you need to try and make sure you've got within your probe explosion, okay? Now, your last task of this week is the excitement of an essay. So, now you're going to plan it. Okay, this is just your planning. You should take at least 10 minutes to do this. It will help. So, how can you plan this essay question? Your essay question is here in bold. How does Shakespeare use language and rhythm to create tension in this scene? Now, you could plan this on a mind map. You could plan this in a table. You could plan this from a bullet point list. It's up to you. These are the things I suggest you cover in your plan. Think about the quotes you've exploded. Where, I've put where to they come. Don't know why. I do apologise. That should be where do they. 
um, was clearly attempting to speak Shakespearean. Where do they come in this scene? Which quotes create the most tension? And where is this quote in the scene? So what I mean by that is, I mean, is it at the beginning of the scene? Is it in the middle of the scene? Is it towards the end? Or is even if they're all fairly at the beginning, what order do they come in? Okay, which one is first? Which one is second? Which one is third? Uh, and think about that for the next uh, bullet point. So that will help you see if the tension is built throughout the scene or does it rise and fall? Do we have tension and then we have it start to calm and then go again and then start to calm? That's what I mean by rise and fall of tension. Okay. Or is it high at the beginning? Do we have a high level of tension at the start and then by the end, a low level of tension? Do we have it staying high all the way through? Or do you think there's no real tension? And why would Shakespeare make this choice? What's the impact? Why keep tension high? Why open the scene with high tension? Why have the tension build as the scene goes on? Or why would you have a drop in tension only to raise it again? What might that do to the audience? What impact could that have? What, how might that represent the emotions of the characters? Uh, so that links into what effect does this have? Uh, the breaking rhythm, the sharing of lines. Where does that come? Why is it significant? How does that link to tension? Does it build and increase tension or does it drop tension? What are they talking about? Okay, that connects to tension. What is the topic? Connotations of those key words. Or connotations are associations, connections that we have with words. The effect of causes. Power. Where is power in this scene? Who has power in this scene? Where does that language and rhythm and tension link to power? Okay, you may want to keep this pause while you do that banning, or you may want to take a picture of it and let it roll on so you can listen to me while you're planning it. That's up to you. So, now, I put some lovely little party poppers on here because I knew you'd be so excited by this end task. Okay, it is essay time. So, how does Shakespeare use language and rhythm to create tension in this scene? I want you to write that question out. I want you to underline it in the margin. I want you to write essay. Okay. Actually, even better, rather than doing it in your book, what would make life so much easier would be if you could do it on Word and then you can upload it to Microsoft Teams. Now, I'm going to try and set that as an assignment in uh, Microsoft Teams. You've got a clear place to um, upload your responses to. But if that doesn't work, just up and um, you go to the file section or in our class on Microsoft Teams and you go to upload. OK, you can upload it there. It just makes it a little bit easier that I've got them all in one space there rather than trying to work through lots of different emails. If you can't do that, it's not the end of the world if you need to email it to me. Uh, if you don't have a computer to type it up in Word, uh, then write it in your book and take a picture. If you can upload the pictures to Microsoft Teams, that's fine. If not, email them to me. I won't lie, it's much easier for me to mark if it's on the computer, if it's done in Word. But if you can't, don't panic. I can live with it being photographed. But one thing you do need to do is try, make sure you're keeping the page really flat when you photograph it. Because some people, there's kind of a bend by the margin. So the start of your sentence is, I can't really read in the picture. So please try and make sure you're keeping that page as flat and straight in the picture as possible. So what do you need to do? Use the what, how, why structure for each paragraph. Now, that isn't what is one paragraph, how is another paragraph, why is another paragraph. What, how, why is one paragraph. You need the what, the how, and the why in each of your paragraphs. Okay? You have this structure copied down. We've written this down on the board and you've copied down what each element of the what, how, why structure is. Okay? And you've also got the previous examples using it. OK, so our old essay questions and your answers, go back through them if you can't remember, if you're struggling with it. Remember, open each paragraph directly answering the question. Use the quote explosions that you just did as your basis for your language analysis. Remember to zoom in on at least two different aspects of your quote. 
linked to effects on the audience and the context. Think about the great chain of being, the fact that it's written for King James I and the position of women in Jacobean England. I want three what, how, why paragraphs, okay? Because you pick in three quotes, so that's a paragraph per quote. This should be at least a page and a half of writing. Obviously, if you're on Word, that might be smaller. Don't write in size 20 font just to make it look like you've done lots. I'm not an idiot. I know that trick, okay? I immediately put it down to size 14. I don't want any bigger than 14 font, okay? Uh, and the really good news about this is that I can't hear you moaning at me. So you can whinge and moan about doing an essay, but guess what, guys? I don't know about it. So enjoy, have fun, uh, email me if you've got any questions, and I look forward to reading your riveting essays, guys. Have a lovely rest of your week. Enjoy the bank holiday tomorrow, and I will see you all soon, hopefully. Bye.